Now, I didn't spend a lot of time on um, the whole Bible study piece. I feel like I want to I wanna go back to that just a sec, and then I'll go through how to form and lead missional communities. But I have found that most Christians obey very little of the Bible that they study. Here's an example. So like if we talk about uh, caring for orphans and widows you know, in James, then this week as a group we'll go, okay, who are the orphans and widows amongst us that we need to care for? So we come back together next week and go, okay, who are they? We don't know. Okay, we're not going on to the next study. We're going to go walk around our streets and we're going to pray and we're going to ask God to open our eyes and maybe a few of us are going to go hang out at the school and ask the principals, is there anybody here that doesn't have a dad? And, and we're, we're going to go find the orphans and widows amongst us. We're not just going to keep moving on to the next text. And until we find them, then we're not going to go on because they're here. We just don't know them. So let's obey this and be serious about caring for these people. And then, then we go, okay, well, what are we supposed to do with them? You know, and Okay, let's learn. Let's care for them. Okay, we might need to go to a few other passages to find out how you care for widows. You know, Timothy has something to say about that. And so all of a sudden, now you're teaching them in real life what the Bible says to do about these issues. And now it's real practical application of God's word to real life. And you say, okay, now let's practice doing that. Oh, we haven't done that yet. Okay, let's not move on to a new study. Let's devote ourselves to the word, which means we are committed to obeying it together. That, that'll be a shift you guys could make, and people will actually start to grow up into, into Christ-likeness. And that'll be a huge shift for most people who've grown up in the church. And it won't be like, hey, we're doing a missional community. You want to join that? It's like, hey, we're going to obey God's word. Let's just get after that. You'll have a missional community if you obey this, by the way. That's the amazing thing. It's like it, it creates pe- the, the kind of community God wants on the, on the planet. So, Yes? Yeah. Well, the beauty is Jesus already died for every single thing you did or have not done. Like, be encouraged. Like, he already knew when he cried out from the cross, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. So if you're sitting here going, I didn't know what I was doing, he already knew that. And he died for that. And uh, there is grace for all, all of our failures and all of our inadequacies and all of our inability to obey him. So just know that. Like, just let that wash over your soul. Versus be compelled by guilt. Don't walk out of here going, oh man, I've got to do so much because I have done so little. That is the wrong place to be. It's, I want to do so much because I've been forgiven so much. I love much because I've been forgiven much. That, that should be our motivation. So, Yes, Thank and then you. Do you lose, like, I think what we're finding is that um, we're losing people because they don't want to. They don't want to obey the word. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, so yeah, I was sharing with the guys over here. I said, I think we've got to start looking at discipleship more like spiritual parenting um, and that we have compassion for God's people and that we don't give up on them and that we don't push them faster than where they're at. And, you know, everybody's at different places. It's so like even my own children, because of their ages and even their unique design by God, I have to disciple each one of them a little bit differently but I'm not giving up on my kids, you know, and I want to gently lead them towards the things of God and not begin to despise them or hate them because they're not growing fast enough or doing what I want. You know, that's not a grace-filled community at all. So we were having, we had a really good conversation over here during lunch about the tendency to be more gracious to non-Christians than we are to Christians. And the reality is, is we're all unbelievers. We just have different places of unbelief in our life. So if we can be gracious with each other's unbelief, then we can create a community of grace. And I think people want to be a part of a community of grace. Uh, I think they're, they're longing for it. The gospel is amazing. Jesus is incredible. So to even let the people know who don't want to obey God's word, that we still love them and we're not going to reject them. But I think we call them to life. You know, like, uh, I, I, I have found, and this is, we had a little conversation about this too, I have found that when people start to obey God's word in community, they, they, they experience a new life. They're living out the new life they already have. They just, they've been living in the flesh so long, they don't know how to, to say no to it. And so once they start experiencing being free from that, it's an abundant life. But it's, it's helping them get there. You know? like, so we've got to gently lead them there. It takes a lot of time, I think, to do that. And I think there's a big, big challenge that we've got in front of us in that so much of Christianity has become a means by which we 
measure up by how well we keep the law. And it kills you. You can't. That's just a way of despising the grace of Jesus, is to think that it's about how well I perform. I was actually with a guy one time counseling him. He was struggling with pornography. And um, not struggling with it. He was looking at it a lot. So, um, and, but he knew he shouldn't. You know, he wanted to see that change. And I met, I met with him. I said, so when you, when you look at this stuff, um, how long does it take for you to get at the foot of the cross and just rejoice in the grace of Jesus who died for that sin? And he said, it takes sometimes days. He said he oftentimes would beat himself up and self-loathe and hatred and all that uh, over what he had just done. And I said, so during those days of you being consumed with what you did, who is it that you're worshiping and putting your confidence and boast in? He said, myself. And I said, so what if, what if right when you look at the stuff, you say, thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me for what I just did? He's like, I can't do that. I said, why not? He did. I said, hey, how about this? What if before you look at the stuff, say, Jesus, thank you for forgiving me for what I'm about to do? He said, if I did that, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I said, I know, because grace will teach you to say no to sin. It's not the law that does it. It's grace that does it. It's realizing what Christ did for you that motivates you to want to, to, to say no to sin. It's, and so the other doesn't work. That's why you keep doing it. And then you hide, and then you beat yourself up, and then you live in constant shame and guilt. And that only puts you into a spiral of ongoing sin. But when you see the cross, and you see the grace of Jesus, and you realize it really is that amazing. He really already died for what you're about to do. So even though you can't obey, he already died for that. And you're already forgiven. So you can go out tomorrow and go, I'm going to fail and I'm probably not going to pull this off. And he's already like, it's already taken care of. Have a great day. And it sounds scandalous, but it's the grace of the gospel. It is scandalous. Luther said, if you're going to sin, sin boldly. It only makes Jesus look that much better. And that's my version of Luther. <laughs> but it's true, right? It's like, gosh, if, if he can... And I'm not saying go out and sin on purpose. I'm just saying, don't you understand that Jesus looks amazing whether you obey well or not? He still looks amazing because when you screw up, he looks incredible because he already died to forgive you of that. And when you do really, really well, he must have been at work in and through you because you couldn't have done it without him. So either way, Jesus is getting fame through your life of brokenness and healing. It's really good. So that can set us free. The weight is not on our shoulders. Boast in your weakness, because the power of God is made manifest in that. Boast in your, in your successes, because it had to have been Jesus. In either way, Jesus gets glorified. And now we're set free. We don't have to feel the weight of trying to perform anymore. Man, praise Jesus. The grace is so good. And some people go like, man, you're going to teach people to like, sin more. Remember, Paul says, by no means. Grace doesn't teach you to want to sin more. It teaches you to want to sin less. That's how it works. It's God's kindness that leads you to repentance. It's His grace that teaches you to say no to sin. So, so let's be grace-filled communities that just continue to welcome people into the hands of Jesus, whether they fail or they succeed. Either way, it's success. So, all right, how do we form and, and build these missional communities? Um, I want to start and just say, be really careful to help people build a gospel foundation in their missional community. You know, that's what I've been talking about all day long, really, is how does the gospel inform us about who God is, our new identity, even as I would, just this last little conversation was about applying the gospel to, to real life. Um, so help them, I, and the, the, I just categorize it these three ways, help them understand the gospel power, okay, you know, Paul, Paul says the gospel is the power of God for salvation for those who believe, um, for the Jew first, then to the Gentile. And then he says, for in it, a right, the righteousness of God has been revealed from faith for faith. The righteous shall live by faith. What is he saying there? He's saying the totality of your salvation, which is the good news of the gospel, is all about faith in God who can save. It's not about you, it's about him. So I have been saved from the power of sin. I have been, it's done. I mean, from the penalty of sin. I've been, I have been saved from the penalty of sin. God is not against me, is for me. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No guilt, no shame, no need to perform. We've got to help our people really understand and believe that. I am being saved by the power of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15. God is actively at work in me right now in my sanctification. I'm not just justified. I'm being sanctified 
by the good news of Jesus Christ, by the power of His Spirit in my life, the resurrected Jesus is actually actively changing me right now. And that's not up to me either. My sanctification is all about Jesus working in me, both to will and to do according to His good pleasure. So I am being saved. And then future, I will be saved. First Peter tells us that our salvation is kept in heaven for us, undefiled, unfaded. We can't, it can't be taken. So we're secure. So now I don't have to worry about tomorrow because the only thing that matters is in his hands. I could lose everything. It's the Jim Elliott kind of heart. Like, who, he is no fool who will gain what he cannot lose to keep what, well, gain what he cannot lose, lose what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. There we go. Uh, so it's like, wow, take my life. That just means I'm going quicker. Kill me. I don't care. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. The only thing that matters is Christ. And I'm secure in his hands, and I'll get to be forever with him in a new body, enjoying a new earth. So if you kill me now, I'm just, I'm just going to get done with this brokenness that I live with every day. Man, I, you know how many days I just want to be dead? Honestly, like, put to death this flesh. Well, there's a quick way to do it. God, take me home. I look at what, you know, Keith Green and you know, all those guys. I'm like, they, they got it good. They got to go early, you know, and be face to face with, oh my goodness, in his presence. If we, but if we don't cherish him, we don't want that. We'd much rather stay here. Now, he did say for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. What is he saying? I love being here because I get to do my, my Savior's work. But I'm not fearful of losing my body. I'm not feel fearful of losing my stuff. I'm not fearful of losing anything because nothing can be lost. It's all secure. That really matters. Everything else will fade away. See, that, that gives us great hope and courage. i got nothing to be afraid of anymore other than the fear of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, which means I'll live the life that he always saved me to live. Does that make sense? So, like, establish them in, in the, the, the past reality of the gospel. I have been saved from the penalty of sin. Establish them in the sanctifying power of the gospel. I am being saved by the resurrected Jesus present in me through his spirit. I will be saved. He will come, and he will make all things new. Everything will be amazing. So now i got nothing to hold back on. And I got no lack of power or ability. I can live this life that he can empower me to live. So build people in that, the power of the gospel. Second, build them to be the gospel people, their new identity. Establish them in their baptismal identity. I don't need to reteach that. That was this morning. Then help them understand that God has saved them for good works in which they, he prepared in advance for them to do, their gospel purpose. So gospel power, gospel people, gospel purpose. Build that foundation really well for people. If they don't get that, you're gonna, they're going to start thinking missional community is a new add-on to spirituality that makes them righteous before God. It will replace the gospel. Be careful. Don't let to-do list replace what's already been done. Okay? Second, develop a gospel-fluent culture. I taught a little bit on this last night. I don't have time to put a lot of it in it today. We have a lot of videos on that if you want to look it up on wearesoma.com. But I'll just give you a couple things. When I start a new missional community, um, after we've talked about the gospel and we've helped them understand their new gospel identity in Christ, um, I, I will spend time asking everyone to share their, their story. I do a little training with them. We have this available. You can actually look it up um, on our site. Um, but it's basically how to help people tell their story making Jesus the hero. And so they, they tell their story and they make Jesus the hero through their story. And I shared this with some of you who were with us last night. We teach our group then to listen to wherever some other hero is showing up other than Jesus in their story. And so they tell their story and then we, we ask, I say, now ask questions of the people. So you know, I remember um, recently we, we were going through a story and one of, the, one of the people in our group had lost their father early on in life. And, and um, someone said, you know, as he told the story, Someone stopped and said, hey, did, did you ever get to a place where you realized that God had been with you all along and that Jesus never really left you? He was always with you, showing you the Father's love? And he said, no, I, honestly, I haven't. Would you mind if we took some time to pray with you that the Spirit of God would show you that he's always been there and that the Father's loved you all along and he was present when your dad died and he was a part of being there by your side. You maybe never saw it. And they took time to pray for him. And, and I think the Lord started to speak to him and really impress on him that he was not alone, that he was dearly loved. And uh, so we might do that. We might stop and say, let's see the part of your story redeemed. Or, yeah, and there could be lots of parts. I know I shared my story and talked about uh, a time when I was really, really hurt by somebody in a very, very significant way. And 
someone stopped when I was done. They said, it still seems like there might be some healing that needs to happen in your heart. Would you mind if we take some time just to pray over you that that part that was deeply wounded might be healed? Sure. And then we did that. And so we got to know each other's stories, but we were listening for where the gospel still could bring hope or healing or encouragement or a presence of God into their life. And what's beautiful about that is you're growing people up and learning how to share their story, but you're also growing people up on how to listen for where the gospel is being proclaimed well or where it's lacking. And they learn, like, like they start realizing the difference between telling a story that magnifies Jesus and telling a story that magnifies us. And I, what I've found is most Christians tell their testimony, and it's usually all about them. And the beauty is, if you can teach them to make Jesus the hero, their testimony is one of the easiest ways to share the gospel through. You know? So train people how to tell their story. The other thing that's great about that is when you go through forming a new missional community and everybody does share their story at some point, you'll actually be able to love one another like family because you actually know each other. It's pretty hard to love like family if you don't know each other. So have them share their story, listen with gospel ears. Now we're going to know how to really care for people well. Okay? So... Also, I'd, I'd encourage you to practice sharing uh, the Lord's Supper together regularly as a church. Uh, we do it every week at our gathering. We encourage our missional communities to feel the freedom to do that together if they'd like, whenever they'd want. But minimally, when we're at our gathering, we encourage them to break up into their missional community and go together to the table, take the bread, dip it in the cup, and they go off together in a group and they begin to practice preaching the gospel to one another there at the gathering. And... Uh, so whoever's preaching that week or teaching a passage of Scripture, they'll actually say, so as you go to the tables, and they'll actually apply the text to the remembrance of Christ and help people then proclaim Christ in light of the text to one another through the bread and the cup, which what that does is every single week they're learning how to appropriate the reality of Jesus through the text to someone's real life in the moment. And if you do that week after week after week after week, 52 weeks a year, which nobody really shows up for that many, but let's say it's 30 in the Northwest, uh, what you're doing is you're giving people the ability to practice proclaiming the gospel through the elements in light of the teaching of God's word, which makes them more fluent because the more that they share the gospel, the better they'll get at sharing it with people who need it. So that's been a really helpful exercise for us. Yeah, what's the obstacles with that for the greater gathering? So if you have lots of gospel communities coming together, is there obstacles if you have one gospel community that goes and does that for the outsider that's there? or for When we set it up, we say, if you're new with us and you believe this, we'd like you to join one of our groups that will be taking community together. So make sure you look around and make sure no one's alone. So we try to get people to bring people into their group. And it's a beautiful way to bring a new person in and then to be able to, you know, and I, I usually, like if I ever do that, I go, I'll ask, do you believe that Jesus gave his life for you yeah, through his death on the cross, has forgiven you of your sins. And, and I'll ask and I'll say, yeah, I do. Um, we've also said, maybe this is the first time you've ever heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. If that you believe it, go with somebody and let them know that this is the first time you've ever come to a place of putting your faith in Jesus and take communion together with somebody. So sometimes we'll do that. So, but, but minimally, we want them to get together with each other because then what happens is, I, uh, subtly, if you don't realize this, if the person who's always setting up the communion and sharing the gospel and kind of doing it to all the people is the person on the stage, eventually you're creating another form of, of, of a papacy, which says, like, they're the only ones who can really do the fun stuff. But when you go, I'm going to set it up and, you know, still clarify what it is, comes out of my teaching, but I send them out to do it. They get to go do it with each other. So they're taking the communion elements, and I love it. Like, whenever I'm in a group, I try not to be the one who leads it. I'll say, I'll say, hey, Andrew, why don't you lead us tonight from my missional community? And I invite a different person each time. And it's great to have them take responsibility to restate the gospel through the elements. And that teaches them how to proclaim it. Remember, what we're told is often as you do this, you proclaim his death. So we need to learn how to proclaim it. So that's the beauty of the communion. Now, let me give you another piece to, to think about. I tried this several years ago, and it just became a really great way to teach people how to get more fluent in sharing the gospel through the elements. Um, I took our missional community, and I, I said, okay, and I, this was just like one of those on-the-spot things that I felt like the Spirit of God gave me. And I said, we're going to take the, the elements, and each one of us is going to share a thing we're struggling with right now, or an area where we think we need God's help. And as they share it, we want one of the others here to take the elements and proclaim the good news of Jesus to that real need in their life. I said, I'll start, because I just want to give you an example. So, um, and this was January, and I, I tend to, I'm a visionary leader, and so the, I look back once in a while. 
January is one of the times I look back. You know, I'm like, how did the year go? And where are we going? And usually I have a vision casting Sunday. And I was very discouraged because it was a year where I just felt like we, we were spinning our wheels and a lot of things that I'd hoped had happened wouldn't hap- didn't happen. And so I'm with the group and I said, I'll be real honest, I'm pretty discouraged right now. I feel like this last year was really a, a bad year and I'm, I'm pretty frustrated about it. And I feel like I've failed and, and I haven't been a good leader in some ways. And, and so I think Randy took the bread and he said, I want to remind you, Jeff, that ultimately... This is not about you. It's about Jesus' works, Jesus' perfect performance. Even if you had a horrible year, it doesn't change anything between you and God. You're still loved. You're still accepted. And he took the cup and he said, and you know what? He shed his blood for the tendency in your life to make this about you, and he's, you're forgiven. You know, because he knew enough about me to know, like, I will go there fast. Like, I'll just go, like, gosh, I did it again. You know, I made it all about me. And so he knew he needed to, jump, he needed to get ahead of that. And it proclaimed the good news of the gospel to me. So he said, Jeff, Christ's righteousness for you, his body given for you, and his forgiveness, his blood poured out to forgive you of of the tendency for you to make this all about you and not about Jesus. You're forgiven. Receive his body. Receive his blood. And I took and I ate and I drank. And then I remember, I think Nikki was next because she doesn't usually hold back from speaking up. And uh, she was like, I look at all you kids. You're so young and you have your whole life ahead of you. And you know, I'm like in my 70s, and I wasted most of my life. And I just have so much regret. And I look at you, and I think, you guys, you guys know Jesus, and you got your whole life to live for him. And that was it. And I'm like, okay, who's going to go? You know, and somebody, it was great because someone said, hey, I want to remind you, you don't have to live with regret anymore because God is a redeemer. Jesus' life redeems all those years. In fact, all those years that you feel like were wasted, he was a part of all of that. And he uses the way you live for yourself as a way to magnify how great he is, that his grace loves you and accepts you and forgives you. No matter how many years you felt felt like you wasted, every one of them God has redeemed, and they're all good years now. And they gave her the, yeah, they said, and that's because of his body, his life for your life. And then here's the cup. He's forgiven you. You need to have no more regret. It's clean. It's forgiven. No more guilt. Receive. She took and she ate and she drank. And, and it just continued one after another after another. And you can imagine every person sharing a need, every person proclaiming the gospel into the need. Now, one, that's a great worship service. Because by the end of the night, you've talked about Jesus a lot. Two, every person has felt the warmth of Christ's love because it got personally applied to their own life. And then three, people are learning how to share the gospel to each unique situation that we face. Now, what you'll find is if you do that, and you lead that, you'll begin to discover who doesn't really know the gospel that well because they'll either never speak up. or not, And I, at one point, I said, I want every one of you to share. I do this with leaders, too. Like, I'll take a group of missional community leaders and have them do it, and then they'll know which, I'll know which ones are struggling to share the gospel into the real needs. So you could do it at a leadership retreat, in fact. I do it with our, our interns, our church planning residents, to see how effective they are at sharing the gospel to real needs. Um, and so that's another way you can help grow more gospel fluency in your people. Can I yes. speak into that? Because um, I came over to a mess last yeah, year. Yeah, she lived with us. Well, yeah. We Not with me. Not with you, but yeah. yeah. And I was with and Nita. And I think this, what you're talking about now, is one of the most profound things that I really took away. Mm-hmm. Like, going to the gathering and when we had the remembrance of me, like, going and, and having to actually practice listening for the gospel and then speaking it. Mm-hmm. But then I remember at the end of our time, we were lucky and we had 13 people in our MERS team. We had two missional communities, so six or seven in each. And we actually sat down and I was in Rowan and Nate's group. And we, had, we did this task, like Randy set it up and we we each shared and we had to, we were assigned a person. Mm-hmm. So I was actually assigned to Row and Row is my brother. Um, and it was amazing, like, I got to hear Rowan share what he was struggling with. And then I had to think, okay, like, what am I hearing? How can I speak the gospel? And, I, and then Anita was in our group too. And I just think, like, they're my siblings, but I got to them in a more deeply profound way through that. And I just understood more, like, there are those elements that we're actually taking the body and the blood, like, we're reminding each other, we need to feast on Jesus like, all the time, you know, weekly, daily. And so I think that was an amazing practice. Yeah.
I encourage you to use the very means by which Jesus gave us to train each other to proclaim the gospel. That's the beauty of it, you know? Here's the other thing, and we'll get to this in the, the afternoon session that we are going to close with. When people learn how to eat under the Lord, then every meal is an opportunity for worship. It's not just I'm just eating. I'm actually engaging in remembrance every time I eat. And that's a great opportunity to develop people in their mindfulness of Christ's sufficiency for them. Any, is there any other questions about that? Did, did that practice make sense? Just, it's a really helpful thing. It's not, and what's beautiful is you're training people how to be the church. I was talking to a group at Exponential. It's a big conference down in Orlando. And, and the, the topic was on um, how to bring disciple-making back to the core mission of the church. And, uh, and I said, one of the things that I think we need to do is we need to figure out whatever it is that we believe the priesthood should do and start to equip and free up God's people to do it. And I, and I said, just to, I said, let me give you an example. Do the people in your church get to serve each other communion? Let me give you another one. Do they get to baptize people? Now, I, 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 you know, you, you maybe are not allowed to in your certain whatever denomination you're a part of, but I, I wanted to bring it up because it's like, what things are we allowing God's people to do and what things are we keeping them from doing? And what's our biblical uh, imperative for why we wouldn't let them do something? Make sure you know it if you have a reason. There may be a good reason you're working through. Um, we have regularly, people from our missional communities will send a thing to the elders saying, hey, you know, we led this people to, to Jesus or we've been discipling this couple and we're doing their pre-engagement counseling. They asked us to do their wedding. Could you license me to do, to do a wedding? And then we just... In our elders' meeting, we say, yes, they're licensed to do a wedding, and then they go do the wedding. And I love that. They're getting to do the stuff. They're marrying people. Some of them are doing funerals. But hopefully, they're not doing too many of those. Uh, they're doing communion. They're baptizing. Whenever someone baptizes, when someone comes to faith, the person who got to lead them to faith or the community that got to bring them to Jesus, they're the ones who baptize them. And so all of a sudden, the church is going like, we're in the game. We're getting to experience all the things that we read about in the Bible. We're doing them. And I, I think that gives people a lot of encouragement that they're participating. I mean, when it says, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, but you don't let anybody baptize, then who gets to make disciples? That's a problem at some point. I actually was uh, meeting with a guy who I deeply respect uh, up in Canada, and he said, I don't think that command was given to, for people. I think it was only given for uh, uh, people who, are, who have the cloth. And... Uh, he said, I don't believe that's really for everyone in the church. And we debated that quite a bit. And I'm like, well, at least you're living out what you say you believe. Because then if you don't let anybody do any of the stuff, at least just because you're basing it on your conviction that this command was only given to the 12 and then to only those who get succession after the 12 who are also appointed as priests uh, by the church. Now, I don't agree with that at all. But I, I was like, at least you're faithful to what you're doing. Whereas I think a lot of us aren't. We like... Go, yeah, we think everyone should make disciples, but not everybody should baptize. Well, then they can't make disciples because that's part of making disciples is baptizing them. That's in the command. So wrestle with that, you know, as you think through your biblical conviction on these kinds of things, okay? Um, okay, you still with me? You doing okay? I, I'm very mindful of the afternoons and how challenging they are. We've got about 20 minutes, so we'll take a break. 15, 20 minutes, is that okay? You can do 15, 20 minutes? Okay. 30. You, you guys are like, last night, you did that the whole time. Like, give us three. I'm going to give you one. No, give me two. You're like always wanting more. I don't know if you're just joking. I, now I don't know how to take you seriously. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, some of this you guys, are, we've heard all this. Why are you telling us everything we've heard before? Um, uh, let, let me give you this. After you develop, a, do you need to hear more on gospel fluency? Some of you heard it last night. Does that make sense? Like, speak the gospel all the time. Use the communion, to use the remembrance uh, meal to do it through. Listen to each other's stories with gospel ears. Um, I, I regularly rehearse the elements of the gospel. Like, have, the, have people do this in your groups. Like, say, have the group leader say, okay, again, what is the gospel? Ask people to define it. They don't know how to define it. It's crazy. They should be able to tell you what the gospel is. Now, you can define it in a lot of ways. It's the power of God for salvation to all those who believe. It's God substituting himself for us. It's Christ's Live, died, rose again, ascend to the right hand of God the Father, will return to make all things. I mean, it's all that. And there's, sometimes we say it in very short phrases, sometimes we say it in longer, sometimes we write a whole paper on it, sometimes we write a whole book on it. And there is a whole book on it. It's called the Bible. So it's all, it's, but 
but help your people be able to articulate it. If they can't articulate the good news that they believe, then how are they ever going to be able to make disciples? And uh, I, I encourage people to be able to do it in a sentence, in a paragraph, in a page, and in several pages in terms of exp explanation. So help them articulate it. Even say, like, what's necessary? What must we communicate when we're communicating the gospel? We've got to communicate the problem of sin. We've got to communicate the, the substitutionary life, death of Jesus. We've got to communicate the resurrection because without it we have no hope. And, and like, ask them those questions so they, they have to wrestle with, are we, do we understand the elements of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Okay? It's important. So have them practice that. Have them regularly say it. Uh, don't let a conversation go in a, in a gathering that's supposed to be centered around Jesus without actually talking about Jesus. Let me encourage you in that one. Like, bring him up a lot. He should be the center. Okay, third. So first of all, build a foundation on the gospel. Second, develop a gospel-fluent culture. Three, I would encourage you, identify a mission together. Okay? Now, I'm not getting a lot of team leadership stuff just because we don't have time in this little bit of time we got today, but we can talk about it later if you want um, in our Q&A. But for, for us, develop a mission, like identify a mission together in case you're asking what I just said. So for us, we've learned that um, we've got to help people identify a people group that they're going to reorient their lives together to reach. And so usually the way I'll describe it is people and place, names and faces. In other words, you've got to actually know people. <laughs> um, and then you know that you've done it, and we'll talk about this in this afternoon session, because you can engage in the everyday rhythms of life with them. You could identify what those rhythms would be. So, for instance, I remember talking to a group of people in Portland, and they, they came to me and they said, you know, we, we have a mission of community. We, our, our mission is the young professionals in Portland. And I said, that's like the whole city. I mean, it's like hipsterville, you know? And uh, they said, I know, that's our problem. We don't know where to begin. And I said... So you don't actually have a defined mission. I mean, that's a big mission. And I, my experience is church planters often can have that kind of a vision. They're thinking about how to reach a whole city or a very large people group. I don't know a lot of people that are that going to be able to, with a full-time job, figure out how to reach that many people. So it's like I want to help them narrow it down just a little bit. And so what, what I've tended to... What's so funny? Did I say so? <laughs> what? Was it? Okay. <laughs> And, and the hipster part, like everybody's a, yeah, yeah. Now you're host oh, the whole city, yeah, yeah. That's so, your, that's your heart, though, though. it is your heart, yeah, and, and it's okay to say we want to reach all of Sydney, but a missional community is going to do nothing about that. They're going to be paralyzed by the, 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 the grandeur of that big vision. So, where do they start? Even Jesus himself was going after the lost sheep of Israel, but where does he start? You know, and so even Paul, when he went to a place, started in the synagogue, or you know, there was a beginning point. They need to have a beginning point, or they'll be they'll be so overwhelmed by it, all they'll do is sit around as Christians talking about it and do nothing about it. So, so, so then I, what I asked them is, I said, um, I said, well, tell me, like, where do you guys spend life together? And they said, well, we all work downtown. I said, do you guys work near each other? So I was looking at, is there some kind of place we can identify? Because they didn't know where to begin. And um, they said, yeah. I said, well, tell me about the, where you're at. And they said, oh, we live in this area. We work in this area. I said, okay. Um, where does everybody, the people that you work around, where do they tend to eat? Where do they go for lunch? Because, you know, you're working in a downtown setting. You can't be driving miles away. You've got to eat and then get back to work. And so they en end up eating these kind of these places. There's these food trucks and these couple of restaurants down the street. And so, why don't, okay, why don't you just start identifying a few, few key restaurants you're going to go to eat in every day? And you're just going to start to get to know the people in those restaurants. And I said, what are people that you work with or people that are in the area, where do they go after work? Well, they go to these couple of different pubs. Okay, so why don't you start spending time at those pubs or bars, hanging out with people after work? Okay, great. And then we just kept, I said, what else do people do on the weekend? I said, well, in, you know, in Portland, a lot of people like to get away, go up to the mountains if it's nice weather. And so I said, okay, great. Why don't you guys start identifying people at your work or people that are young professionals that like to go hiking? Okay, I'm trying to help them like, to find some kind of a, a people group because they, they were just like, overwhelmed with the, the, the grandeur of the mission that they did nothing about it. 
And so as I helped them hone it in, they said, okay, oh, this makes sense. We could eat with a group of people. We could go to the bar with a couple of people. We could go uh, hiking with a few people. And I said, and I know Portland's all about social justice kind of stuff, so why don't you guys identify a key issue that you want to address as a community and pull some people in the young professional community to go help work on that maybe once or twice a month as a way of just showing what the kingdom of God looks like breaking into the world, caring for brokenness. I'm like, okay. I said, now, when you do that, your job is to figure out some people, get to know some people. And as you get to know people, pray that God gives you almost like a person of peace or somebody that seems to like, like want more of what you're bringing. And they kind of open a door for you into a group of people. Because that, that's what Jesus said when he sent them out in pairs. Like, pray that you find this person that will welcome you in and begin to kind of open more doors for you and care for you and support you in this. And so I said, look for that. And then if you can't ever get to a place where you can identify how Monday through Sunday would look different if you were reaching those people, you still haven't identified your mission. But in this season, you've got to figure that out. So I kind of gave them that task to begin to figure that out. Pray, ask God, move forward. Now, that was pretty hard because they were starting with such a big thing. I encourage people to find something that's a little bit more focused, like, hey, we're going to reach this high school and the parents and kids there. Uh, we have a missional community that found out that Lincoln High School uh, football team, 85% of the boys there don't have a dad present in their life. 85%. Okay, a great opportunity for the kingdom of God to break in because the fatherless get a father in the kingdom. You know, they're not without parents anymore. They're not without a dad. And, and we happen to know John Kitna, who used to be a professional football player. Some of you may have heard him. I know that you don't have football here, but I mean, you have football, but it's... Sorry. <laughs> I know you have Aussie rules, Aussie rules football, and, uh, but you don't have American football. And you also, you have soccer football, but I was talking to someone who was like, you guys don't even watch your soccer team. Like, what's wrong with you? I know. <laughs> I knew that was the answer. I just was asking for you to say it, not me. So, anyway. So John Kitna was an NFL quarterback, and he's now coaching that football team, and he's a believer, and he's really wanting us to step in. So one of our mission communities said, we're going to make our mission Lincoln High School, and or especially those boys and their families. And then they began to ask, what kinds of rhythms would we engage in if we were actually going to reorient our life to reach those kids and their families? Well, brainstorm with me. What do you think that they came up with? Coaching. Yeah, they're going to help out with some coaching. Go to every Friday night game. So they actually came to the conclusion, a lot of these boys don't have anybody in the stands yelling for them, so we're all going to make sure every kid has a fan. And they wore their jersey, you know, they were cheering for them. They came, after the game, they went up to them and said, man, way to go, I was cheering you on. And, you know, they, they made a point to encourage them, because that's what a dad would do. A dad would pay attention to his son on the field. And even if he didn't get in, he'd say, hey, man, you're a great team member. You cheered your team's on, team on, way to go. Keep it up, buddy. You know, so they did that. What else do you think they came up with? Um, yeah, they actually, um, it was interesting. One of the boys on the team, in conjunction with the mission community, said, what if, what if I, because we can't do this, but he said, what if I ask the school if we can have a chapel every Thursday, and you guys bring the food, and we'll have, like, it'll be after school, be dinner time, and I can, he can do a, a student-sponsored chapel. We couldn't. And the laws in our community won't let that happen. But we could come in and speak if he invited us. So he basically set it up so we brought the people brought food every Thursday in the weight room, and all the guys that wanted to come after practice and eat a meal could come. They, uh, one of the people from the mission community got up and shared a short gospel message. Then they broke up into groups and ate pizza together in groups, and each one of the adults from the mission community led in each one of the little small groups with the boys a discussion about Jesus. And then about 30 or 40 kids came every Thursday. Uh, nine kids came to faith through that in three months. It's amazing. And these were normal, everyday people that got to do it. It wasn't, it wasn't me showing up and doing it all. It was like normal people getting to do it. It was really awesome. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just joking. That was a joke. <laughs> you guys caught it. I've got to get you laughing once in a while. Go ahead. I'm weird. That's all there is to it. Yeah. I guess my concern is if we try to do something like that, and you like the public schools or whatever, they say, oh, you're just using this as a front door to get in and, you know, try and get people to come to your church. And they might, you know, get a sniff of it and just shut the whole thing and say, hey, yeah. we don't want anything to do with this. Well, that, let me just be clear. Not one of those boys has come to our church in terms of our gathering. We've never made that our goal. So if, if, if that is your goal, then you're in trouble. 
If your goal is to build your event, you're already suspect. If your goal is to get them to Jesus, and I don't care what church they land in, I just want them to be in community with people who keep pushing them toward Christ, then I'm okay. So that's what, like John Kitten is the football coach. He isn't even a part of Soma. He's a part of another church. And I don't care if they end up at his church or any church. I just want them to be in community. And I think when you start to have that, you get rid of the competitive nature. And I, by the way, I know it's here in Sydney, and that's got to die in this area. And it may be in Australia, but the idea that it's our church, it's like it's not. I just want them to get to know Jesus and be a part of his church in whatever expression it finds itself in in our city. So I think when you do that, then the school doesn't feel like you're trying to build up your agenda through them. But is it, I think the concern is that you're proselytizing them. Wouldn't that be the issue? Like the yeah. principal comes in and says, hey, you can't do that. You can't push your religious faith on these boys. Yeah. You're here to coach them. If we hear again, you're talking about Jesus, you're out. Yeah, I guess that's the risk you take. But I think, um, let me keep telling the story. Because um, the, the principal is a guy who lives on my block who opposed every message of the gospel I've ever given to him and was anti-Christian, really severely. And we came in and said, we are not here primarily just to proselytize. We are here to bless this school. And I, and I think I'm fine, and that's what we are doing. Literally, we're blessing the school like crazy. Now, we did say, if kids ask us, we're going to talk about it. Um, and he knows that if a high school student wants to support something, he can do that because he has freedom to do that. That's part of our laws. So he's playing within the rules that the school's set. Um, so so that, let's keep going. What else do you think they might have done? You know, I'm going to just give you where we're at today. Cause it's a, what? That's right. Some of the kids need tutoring help. I found out in interacting with them, some of these kids could be Division I athletes, like playing for a big college, get recruited, but they don't even know how to fill out an application. I'm actually just meeting with one of them weekly now. His name is Michonne. And he told me, he said, will you help me raise money so I can actually go to check out colleges? Because I won't be able to go to a college unless I go visit one. So we're helping him raise money so he can fly out to a few colleges that he wants to look into going to. So we're raising money to help him fly. We're helping him fill out applications. We're do t doing tutoring. Keep going. What else? Prayer. Prayer, yeah. People just praying for him. We have some people who are like, I can't be at every game, but I'll be praying for those kids. And so they find out prayer requests. Have to be house. That's right. We have a few people who, uh, because they walk through their, they live in the neighborhood, and they, they said, anytime you need to stop by, let us know. We'd love to have you over for a meal. And I mean, it's fun to hear some of the stories. Because these boys, where are they going to go? They go after school. There's nobody home. So the beauty is now you've got stay-at-home moms going, I can be in the game because I can have them stop by my house. And so we've got several moms who open up their home, and they're like being a mom to a boy who doesn't have a mom at home because mom's working two jobs just to try to support their family. Okay, yes. The support for the mothers somehow, yeah. I don't know how you do that, but I'm sure there's lots of need with moms out. Yeah, and I don't know that, I don't know if they're, I can't give an example of that yet. So they may be, so I'll only speak to what I know they're doing so far. But that's a great idea. <coughs> yeah, we can keep going. What? I'm just wondering why people keep saying single moms, because everything inside me is saying, what about the dads? Yeah. Because it just keeps coming up, and I'm thinking, if there's a single dad here, they'll be like, oh my gosh. Yeah. I don't care. Well, in my particular context, there aren't a whole lot of yeah, single dads. Yeah, because we've got a single yeah. dad in our So I'm just telling our story. You know? yeah. I'll tell you about single dads in a second. Most of our single dads are in prison. That's my city. So it's just the reality of where we're at. So, but, um, on Pick up? Like you pick them up? Yeah. Some people give them rides. Actually, when they were trying to raise support for the support, supporting their school, a lot of these kids don't know how to raise support, so we actually created like fundraising um, events at cafes, and we told everyone to show up and plan to give a lot of money. And then we had, the kids couldn't get there, so we had a bunch of people give rides to the place, and then they started doing that on a regular basis. We have some people who said, we're going to help out with the managers, the girls who help manage the locker room and wash all the jerseys and wash all the towels and hand out equipment. And so they were, so they were, they were young, they were women helping the girls. That, was that weird? <laughs> That's how it works in our school. I'm just telling you. <laughs> so, so they, what? After game parties. After game. When you go party, That's right. The game, yeah. So maybe they have. Uh, yep. They invite the kids to after parties. Yep. And, and we have some guys who like to paint, and the bleachers all need to be in painting, so they started doing work on the stadium, and we could just keep going, right? Well, here's what it landed on. We didn't have a facility to gather in as a church this last year, and the principal. <laughs> Um, said, hey, we want Soma to be more and more involved in our school because of the way that you've been blessing our school. So we'd like to have you start meeting our auditorium now. 
on Sundays, and we don't want to charge you for it. And he found out the union requires that he at least pays for janitorial service, so he's only charging us janitorial service fees. And now we get to have this 800-seat auditorium for our church to gather in on Sundays. And it's the principal that opposed the gospel, wanted nothing to do with it, who's now saying we need more and more of it. And then what he told our, the missional community, he said, can we have a breakfast with our entire faculty so your missional community could sit down with our faculty and we can tell you all the other needs that our school has and see if you're willing to help us on those. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I mean, it's huge. The door of the gospel is just wide open right now in a place that was so opposed to it. Why? Because the kingdom of God showed up in tangible form. See, when it's only a proselytizing, that, for most people that hear it, it's, we just want, you to, we just want to preach. But we want to display the kingdom of God breaking into the world and changing it. And now we got something to talk about. And he, did, he can't deny it. These people are doing stuff nobody's willing to do. He could not find for years anybody who would help out their school. And our people are just loving on these kids like crazy. So now I can't wait because now we're going to get to be there all the time. And uh, the, one of the women who's in charge of helping that lead that mission community, she, she's now dreaming of what if we could have an office in the school that provides ongoing care for kids who need extra counseling or pa families to stop in and get support. And so, I mean, it, who knows what this is going to become. I'm really excited about it. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, just in regards to uh, a mission, uh, so living life, life on life and living life together in a way, it's not adding something on, it's not adding an event, it's not adding... Uh, often as we're seeking to do mission, it can feel like this is huge, this is this big thing, and I, I don't know, I feel even with us as we're starting to see a new church, a new uh, mission or community through that, almost doing a mission that's not too hard, not that, like it's, it's a month, so at the moment we're doing a mission which is our street, and trying to draw our people into that, yeah. um, and it's... And it's easy because we live there, yeah. And stuff's happening, and but it's not mean we have to do something that's, yeah. You know, it's it's doing mission. It's not another thing too much. Is that is there a case, or even just starting or that? Yeah, I, I think I think a good entry point is to pick something that fits into the rhythm of your life as it already exists. I do believe there's sometimes where people go, I feel called to something so much, I'm willing to re reorient my life in a very different way to reach those people. That whole mission to uh, the high school, it started with just, can we just start going to football games on Friday night? And then it bled into, because when you start to love a group of people, you want to you change your life to love them. You know, I mean, they have people who ride the bus to their, with their, them on, you know, to away games. They're on the bus with them. And I mean, it's like, in fact, I just found out um, they're going to go down, the school's going to play a special game down in Portland, and they want the entire missional community to go with them to be chaperones, to help with the kids and be in the hotel with them for the whole weekend. It's like, what a huge invitation for us to welcome these kids as our own. Like, they're, they're, they're really hurting. Jeff, Jeff, can I ask, are there any people in the church who actually have kids going to the school or have a part of the school? None of them do yet. Yeah. Not that because it's a high school and we're a pretty young church. So most of them have little kids. But what's really cool is the, the team, the high school players, actually do a, a youth football camp in the summer. So they're bringing their kids to the football camp that these kids they've been pouring into are now going to pour into their kids. So that's a pretty cool thing that's going to happen. Because I'm, I'm just seeing in my context, there's, there's loads of opportunities to, yeah. to do stuff. I think the thing that a lot of churches, and you know, my local church does, does this as well, or doesn't do this, is actually thinking about how we as a community can go together to you know, bless a school or service. Because mm -hmm. there's lots of opportunities. Oh, there's out, so out, many. You know, out, out, primary schools and high schools. My mission, the mission of my mission community is our local elementary school where my kids go. So it's, it's in the flow of my life. You know, I'm hanging out there. I'm getting to know the, the teachers. Janie, my wife, you know, has a, the day free because we've decided that's a good way for her to be able to have her time to give to the school. So she's at the school almost every day helping out in class. So can you tell us how maybe you've involved your gospel community in the life of that given that yeah. there's often, there's, there'll obviously be people in that group that don't have young kids yeah. um, who aren't going to school. How are you, you know, then doing missions together? You know? We do, uh, so they, they do, they raise money for arts program in that school because the, the state cuts off all that support and we can't afford it anymore. And so we do, we lead an auction that to raise money for the arts program and our whole mission community is the ones who serve at the whole auction. They're, they're at the table setting up things, they're checking people in and, and uh, it was amazing this last time we did it. Um, and we're not the only one. There's a couple of mission communities. Dave's mission community is a part of that as well. And um, 
they, um, the people were like talking to our mission of community going, why are you here? You don't have any kids here? A couple of them are teachers at another school. I'm like, why aren't you at your own school? And they're like, well, we're, we're a part of this group that just feels called to care for this church or this school. And we were here to love. And one of the, one of the girls that was with us, uh, one of the ladies finally said, I don't get it. Why in the world would you do this? Because she had been, I mean, it's like three or four months of preparation up to it, like meeting after meeting after meeting. We're doing all the art stuff. I'm, I'm literally one of the only men sitting down to like doing like folding up uh, p- uh, tissue paper around these things to make these flowers that go in a vase. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, the, I'm like hanging out with all these ladies. And they're like, why are you here? And I'm like, I just want, you know, I want to serve and I love, love the school and I love what it's about. And, you know, and so it's fun. But this one girl who had been a part of the whole deal, her name's Emily. They said, why, the, uh, the other lady, I asked her, why are you here? And she said, this is Jesus' church showing up to serve this school. And she's like, I grew up in a Lutheran church. I know nothing about what you just said. What do you mean? And she said, Jesus' church is his body, and his body goes everywhere, and we're here as his body to serve you like Jesus served us. And then the next thing she says, she says, I still don't get it. We're going to have to talk more about this. And Emily said, invite me over for dinner, and we'll talk about it. And she goes, you got it, but you don't know what you just asked for. She goes, yes, I do. Let's do it. So they have, I don't know if they've had dinner yet, but that was a big open door because they're going, why are you guys here? So that's one thing we do. David might have told you if you've been with him, a lot, some of the kids don't, don't eat unless they go to school because they eat breakfast at school and lunch at school. And so we, there's a group that helps put together backpacks and fills those with food. Well, this summer, David's missional community is leading us as well to join them in doing a Friday night cookout because they need food. And so we're going to keep reaching out to those families. Um, some of us do tutoring at the school. And then vice versa, what about um, how, how families may be serving uh, young adults? You know, so, so the, the opposite... Yeah. Because, you know, the, the demographic focus or just the reality that families connect with families, yeah. young adults connect with young adults. How, well, how do you yeah. get that diversity, I guess? Yeah, so most of my group that I'm leading right now is almost all young adults. There's only about two families in our group right now. Um, so what they're getting is us pouring into them and discipling them and, and helping them grow up. And they're longing to see parents parent their kids. They're longing to see a couple love one another because they, they, they haven't seen it. So... It's just us being devoted to their development and them becoming godly men and women. So making our home available, having them hang out, eating meals together. You know, they're getting that kind of... Uh, the way I look at it is, and I've told them, I disciple you best when I lead you on a mission that causes you to die to yourself. Uh, so they really have to, because this is not really about them. So we're also working on Nikki's backyard still, doing that garden and you know, inviting people into that. And a lot of my, my kids are out there working on the garden with these young adults and... They're getting to disciple my kids, and so they're learning how to do discipleship of little kids, which is great. I mean, how many young adults get trained in that? Very few. And then when they have kids, they're, they're messed up. They're like, I don't know how to parent. So we're training them and preparing them. So, Well, I'm, I'll be doing, I do pre-engagement counseling for some of those young adults as they find somebody and want to get married. I'm about to do that with another couple right now that's in my group. And so the beauty is I'm, I'm getting to do pre-engagement with somebody I live life with. That's a, and then pre-marriage. And we do pre-engagement before they get engaged, and then we do pre-marriage before they get married. And so we help them get ready to even think about, if you're going to say, I do, yes, I want to get married, most people don't even have a clue what they're saying yes to. So we want to even prepare them before they say yes, and then prepare them for the wedding day. And so it's that kind of stuff, too. Yeah. So, Okay? Yes, Francesca? Uh, sorry, okay. <laughs> You're, you're terrified about what? The pre-engagement stuff? Um, let's not get into that. Okay. All right. Yeah, one, real quick. Yes. What, one word on young adults, because one thing that we do face is that you have a young adult who will come in and they'll say, well, we don't feel called to that, that school. And so, you know, what we have, some missional communities have wrongly done in the past, they said, oh, um, okay, we should join the missional community. But what Jeff and I have worked through that I think is a big part of my development is helping those people see that's okay. This is not about our little mission. This is about the big mission of disciple making. And this is a context in which we're going to help you become followers, the greater followers of Jesus. Um, so spend a season with us and we'll release you to go lead your own mission. 
So when you put it that way, they feel liberated, like, mm -hmm. oh, like I'm not locked in here forever, so this is something I'm gonna do for a season, mm -hmm. and in this context, I'll be trained, and then I'll be released. So, so every young adult that comes to my missional community, because I have a handful of young couples, I'll tell them, hey, just so you know, here's my goal. My goal for you is to be a disciple of Jesus, which means we're gonna work it out in this context, and we're gonna release you to do it yourself. They're like, oh, okay, well, I yeah. cared about it, you know? So you don't turn people away, but you use that opportunity as a way to disciple those people and then release them. Yeah, think of it this way. If you've got a whole bunch of people in your group, you're doing just make disciples this way, you're doing make disciples this way. Okay? The group that's going on mission is getting discipled while they're on mission. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, Jesus says. So they're not really on Jesus' mission. I mean, they don't, they don't have their mind set about reaching the lost sheep of Israel and going to the cross. I mean, they don't have a clue what's going on. But he's discipling them while they're on the mission so that when he ascends, he says, now you will be witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria in the uttermost parts. In other words, I've been training you for this all along. So what David said is, we'll often, because all of people say, well, my mission is this. And my first question is, do you feel equipped to lead a, a community of people on mission to make disciples to that group of people? If they say yes, I might assess them and check that. One of the ways I do check it is I say, you have a month to recruit people to join you on that mission, and then after that month, we'll sit down with all of them and see if they would affirm you as a leader who can lead them to make disciples who make disciples. And a lot of times, there, there, there are times when that happens. Most often, they come back and they go, I got nobody. And I go, okay, so we got some training to do. Join me on this mission for a season, and then we'll train you to be ready so when you are sent, you can actually take some of these people and join you in that mission because they'll trust you, they'll know you, your leadership will be built up, and we'll send you out to start another missional community. And so it's always either join us for a season so we can send you out or join us for a long term or you're already ready, go out. And what's beautiful is people sometimes then say, I'm so committed to this mission, I'm going to make life changes and life decisions based upon it. And I, it doesn't always happen, but I've seen people say, I'm willing to move to this area for a season for that very reason. I mean, that's a huge pe deal when people make housing choices because of that. Um, so we're going to take a break. Okay. How long? Uh, 15 minutes? 20? How many? 10. 10. You got till 4. Okay?